Well, good morning. It's good to be back. I We joked earlier, at some point this year, I will be here to preach and Richard will be here. But uh, we haven't had that yet. And for good reason, I'm grateful he's recovering. He's recovering well after a few a few setbacks, which I think was expected in, in some ways with a procedure like that. But I, I just thank God that he continues to recover. And, and it looks like he's going to be able to continue to, to move forward with that. And so uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to not just be here today, but looking forward, the Lord allows for me to be here the next two Sundays after that to walk through the book of Titus for us to be able to, to spend our time in, in a whole letter. So I'm going to invite you to turn there, the book of Titus, chapter 1. You find the New Testament three quarters of the way through your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and keep turning. That's the New Testament. Go about halfway through, you'll hit the T's. When you hit the T's, you're close. You're at Thessalonians and Timothy, and then Titus right after that. And we are going to look at this entire letter, Lord willing, in three weeks, three chapters in three weeks. So hopefully that will be a, a very clean and clear way to be able to approach this particular book, this letter. As you're turning there, uh, I want to share with you that uh, I'm getting to do a lot of travel with my new role. You know, I was a pastor for 25 years and and then started with full practice shepherding full time about 18 months ago. And I've, I've been able to have time to, to go a bunch of different places work with pastors all over the world. And I was in last October, I was in Brazil and worked with a, a bunch of pastors who were there who speak Portuguese. Uh, in January, I was in Puerto Rico working with a group of pastors who spoke Spanish. And then last week, I was in Scotland and England working with a bunch of pastors there, though they speak English, depending on what part of Scotland you go to, it doesn't sound like it. So uh, it depends on the, how thick the accent is. But um, nonetheless, I learned something, I continue to learn something as I get to travel all over the world and get to work with different pastors. And that is, it doesn't matter what, where the pastor's from at parts of the world, regardless how different their customs are, their cultures are, even their languages, it doesn't matter. The calling of a pastor I continually see is the same everywhere. And the reason I know this is because God's Word here in the New Testament, in particular, gives a detailed description of what a pastor is and what a pastor does, in a sense, how they serve as a pastor in the church. This, as well as many other aspects of what the local church is called to be, we will find in the three chapters of this book, the book of Titus, this letter to Titus. Now, we want to acknowledge this is a letter. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to his young pastoral protege, trainee, Titus, in the ministry. And we need to keep, it's really important that we understand this is a letter, because if you received a letter in the mail this week, and you read the first half of it, and then stopped reading, you probably would not fully understand what the letter was supposed to be about to you. And same with these letters, we want to be able to read the entire letter and understand it, but also to know how it fits together. And Paul writes this letter to Titus for him to understand it in its fullness. And that's what I I hope we're able to do with our time together as well. So I want to start with the main idea of Titus. We're jumping into this book that is a letter. And there's one main idea that you will see all throughout the book of Titus. And it's this. And you'll find it up on the screen there. The gospel of Jesus Christ that you believe will affect your behavior. That's the main idea of this whole letter. The gospel of Jesus Christ that you and I believe will affect our behavior. And so a summary of the book of Titus is this. Three parts to it. Church pastors in Titus chapter 1. Church members in Titus chapter 2. And then church action or church living in Titus chapter 3. Now the reason I want to show you that from the beginning is again for us to see this letter as a whole. Not not just chopped up in the way that we're going to, to look at it. So I want to do a little exercise here with you, because my goal is, is by the end of our time together these three weeks, that you will know the book of Titus really well. If somebody stops you on the street and says, that's some random question, hey, what's the book of Titus about? You can just rattle it off right there. And these three areas of summary is the best way to know the book of Titus. So I want you to repeat this after me. We're going to do this every week. Ready? Church pastors, church members, Church actions. 
Okay, very good. And that is the summary of the book of Titus. And we're going to look at chapter 1, Titus chapter 1, which is about church pastors in particular this morning. So I would like for us to read chapter 1. Would you stand, please? In the honor of God's word. We're going to read Titus chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes, Paul, servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness and hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God our Father, God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put in what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and to the commands of people who turn away from tr the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. This is God's word. Amen. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would send your spirit to come and be mightily at work in each one of us. Give us wisdom, knowledge, and discernment, understanding, and clarity that we might leave here clear and sure of what you call us to do and that we would respond to your word in that way. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. As mentioned, uh, I'll be here the next three weeks, and I don't want to just preach three sermons on Titus, but my desire is that you truly see how the book of Titus fits together. This is a blueprint of what God's design is for the local church. So regardless if it's the first century, which is when this was written, when Paul wrote to Titus, the church had not existed yet. So as the churches are being established, we learn here in Crete, Paul leaves Titus behind to set in order what remains. In other words, the churches were not fully established. Something had to be done to set them up properly. So Paul leaves Titus in Crete to do this in particular. And it doesn't matter if it's the first century or if it's Brazil or Puerto Rico or Scotland, England, or Bloomfield. The design is the same. And that's what's so helpful about us being able to look at this letter and read it for ourselves and to know how we can pursue to establish our own churches to the design of God. So look at verse one with me. We see, we want to make a couple of pretty obvious observations just to, as we set into this letter. Paul, verse one tells us that Paul writes this letter to Titus, Titus in verse four, and he instructs Titus. In verse 5, to put what remained in order and to appoint elders in every town as I direct you. Elders, don't be confused with that. That is simply pastors. The word elder 
is referring to the same office as a pastor. There are two offices of the New Testament, we are told, and that is pastors and deacons. And when he mentions elders here, he is referring simply to the office of, of a pastor. And apparently these new churches, look in verse 5, they were in Crete and they were not set up as they were intended to be or needed to be. And so this is, was an essential task that Paul was giving Titus to continue this work. We also know from Paul's words here that Paul's writing for the sake of God's people, for the sake of specifically those that Jesus has saved and redeemed and was calling to be a part of the church as one of his redeemed people that he has saved by faith alone. Look at verse 1. Paul says, for the sake of the faith of the elect. It's referring to those who God calls to salvation. Faith of God's elect, their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness and the hope of eternal life. So those he saves, those he redeems, those who live that, that godly life out of that, because the Spirit is at work in them, to eventually lead to eternal life that comes. And Paul's writing for the sake of the people in these new churches in Crete. And these three chapters we're going to look at, it maps out a very important design that every church should pursue. So the first main point Paul wants to make as he's instructing Titus is to finish setting up these churches the way they're supposed to be. And I want us to notice what's the very first thing he says he has to do. Appoint pastors. Can we all agree that who leads the church is probably a good place to start? I don't know too many churches that thrive that have no idea who is supposed to lead in the church. And so that's an obvious point to, to start at. So Paul is starting with who is appointed and called to actually lead these new churches in Crete, and this design is the same for us also. So Titus chapter 1 can be summarized in this way. There are two parts. So if you're taking notes, here are the two parts. The first part is verses 5 through 9, so take your eyes there. Verses 5 through 9 defines who the pastor is and what he's called to do. That's part 1. Part 2 of Titus chapter 1 is he defines those who the pastors are to protect the church from. Isn't that an interesting contrast? He spends the first half saying, these are the pastors who are supposed to lead the church. And then he tells us who the pastors protect the churches from. God calls every pastor to do two things. That is to proclaim and to protect. God calls every pastor in the world, any generation, any time period, to do two things, to proclaim and to protect. So the first thing we're going to look at this morning is that God calls every pastor to proclaim God's word, to proclaim his word. Look at verse 9. This main verse helps us understand the call and work of a pastor. Verse 9, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he is able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. Do you hear that in there? That he proclaim and protect. Proclaim and protect. A pastor's call is a call to minister God's word. It's one of the primary callings of a pastor, to minister the word of God. What does he proclaim? Well, he proclaims, look at verse 9, the trustworthy word. He proclaims, Sound doctrine. They declare, pastors declare Christ and him crucified. They, they proclaim the gospel. And they do it in two ways. In the first way you already see on your screen. The first way God calls every pastor to proclaim God's word with their mouth. Look at verse 9 again. Again, this is a main verse to understand. He says, hold firm the trustworthy word as taught. Pastors speak. They teach. They preach. And with their mouth, they minister God's word to give instruction, to exhort in sound doctrine, but also to speak rebuke. So pastors speak God's word, sound doctrine, as it's also referred to here. They speak his word. They speak the good news of Jesus Christ. It, it's, it's the proclamation of God's word that is a central force to build the church. Which is why Paul in this letter, he starts with pastors, and he starts with pastors proclaim God's word, because that's how the church is built. 
The pastors proclaim God's word with their mouth, but also, secondly, with their ministry. With their ministry. Take your eyes down to verses 6 through 8, that section there. This talks about the qualifications of a pastor. In other words, how do you know, should everybody be pastors? Well, the answer is no. It's those who are called and then qualify in their life by the way this is, is described. Verses 6 through 8, really interesting. There's a list of things here. These aren't exhaustive in trying to talk about who a pastor is and what a pastor is supposed to be a, a like and about. But these are some of the core qualifications that we can't ignore. So look at some, look at verse 6. Part of the qualification involves his family, that he's faithful to his wife, that he cares for his kids. His kids are submissive when they are in the home to his, his leadership, even if they don't follow Jesus. Look at verse 7. There is this aspect of godly living that a pastor is supposed to live out. Remember earlier what we said was the main idea? The gospel we believe will affect our behavior. Pastors are to model what this is, to believe this, and your life reflects that you truly believe this. Verse 8 mentions several aspects of just the ability to care for others. Just goodness, godly living, being kind and gentle and caring for others. This ministry of proclamation that a pastor has, it's not just with his mouth. It's actually with his life. And that's what the call really is. The gospel we believe will affect our behavior. Pastors are to be defined and identified by this living word being lived out in their life. And that's quite a call. And if you need more to more evidence that this is true and accurate, we can probably all share stories of how we watch the work of Christ hindered through pastors all over the world speaking one thing and completely living contrary to what they speak. We would all have stories about how the work of Christ has been hindered and the church has been harmed through that. This is probably a good time to acknowledge, though, that when we're talking about this transformation that takes place in a pastor's life, to be able to live that up comes through faith alone in Christ. It's not something we just try hard and do. That Jesus has to save the soul of each one of us through faith alone in him, and that must take place in a pastor for him to be able, by the power of the Spirit, to live this out in his life. In the same way, you must have the Spirit's empowerment for it to be lived out in your own life. So pastors proclaim God's word. Here's the second thing they call to. Not just proclaim, but also to protect. Pastors are called to protect God's flock. Paul's highlighting a major contrast in the, in the middle of this chapter, and I want you to notice it with me. Look at verse 9, and then how it flows into verse 10. When we talk about him protecting God's flock. He may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also rebuke those who contradict it. Then Paul shifts and describes those who contradict this, who the pastor is supposed to protect. Verse 10, for there are many who are, and then he starts to describe them. And the summary of these men that the pastors protect the church from, you find in verse 16. Look there with me, verse 16. It says, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable disobedient, and unfit for any good work. So pastors are called to be the example of, of what it means to know God and live that out in their life. We see that in verses 6 through 9. Then the contrast is these men that profess to know God, but they deny Him by their life. Isn't that an interesting contrast? And by the way, one we should make note of on why the pastors are called to protect the flock from these men. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. Remember, it says they profess to know God. You know what that means? They probably know exactly how to dress at church. They know the Christian lingo. They eat Chick-fil-A every week. A lot of non-Christians do that too, with good reason, by the way. They, they profess to know God. So they're deceiving people. And the way you identify them is you you see that they deny God by the way they live their life. And pastors are to be the ones 
to watch for those people and to protect the, the flock from them. The pastors don't just proclaim God's word, they protect the flock from two specific people. And I've already begun to talk about the first one. The first one is from false teachers. From false teachers. Let's look at this list of now, remember 6 through 9, he described what a pastor is. And then 11 through 16, he described who these, these false teachers are that the pastors are to protect them from. Look down at verse 10 with me. They're insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers. Verse 11, they must be silenced. They're upsetting families. They teach falsely. Verse 12 is this generalization of a Cretan that he uses to describe them. Now, notice what he does is he takes a Cretan and quotes them about what a Cretan's like, just to make his point. Verse 15, both their mind and their consciences are defiled. And so verse 13 says that they have to be rebuked sharply. They are to be identified so to protect the flock from them. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. They profess to know God, but deny him by their deeds. That's the first group these pastors are supposed to protect the church from. But there's a second group that I want to show you in this passage that's not as clear, but I believe it's embedded here in this passage. The second group that pastors are to protect the church from, themselves. Themselves. Look down at verse 5 with me again. Paul's instruction there, to appoint elders, plural, pastors, more than one pastor. There could be many reasons for this, and we could have a conversation about the multiple reasons why having more than one pastor versus just one pastor is a benefit and a gift to the church. But here's one reason I think is embedded in this passage. More than one pastor allows there to be accountability among the pastors. When there's only one pastor, it's harder to bring that. Now there's leaders and even the church ultimately can hold, can hold a pastor accountable, and I would pray that churches would do that. But the design seems to be that pastors who are called to the same thing can hold each other and challenge each other and encourage each other to be faithful in these same things. So look at verses 6 through 9 again. Pastors are called are call one another to live in this way. There's specific things described there. Look at verse 7. To be faithful to family, above accusation, to be humble and kind and, and gentle. Pastors challenge and hold each other accountable to, to be walking in these things. Verse 8. Hospitable, lovers of good, self-controlled, upright, and holy. Verse 9. Pastors hold each other accountable to make sure they are, verse 9, holding firm to the trustworthy word that is being taught. Pastors call each other to faithfulness to protect the flock. Did you notice something in the Timothy reading we did a few moments ago? At the very end, Paul writes to Timothy, another young pastoral protege, and he says, keep watch on your doctrine and life. Why would he say that to him? Because any man can fall. No one is above the enemy coming and taking a hold. No pastor is beyond the battle of sin. So Paul challenges Timothy, challenges Titus, and even in the book of Acts, in Acts 20, you go read that this afternoon. He specifically challenges them to take heed to yourself and the flock. Why does he say take heed to yourself? For this very reason, a pastor's job is to also Protect the church from themselves. And it's an incredible design when that happens. One of the many reasons I think we would agree that we find ourselves in the mess that we're in in our denomination with all the abuse allegations. As I've looked into it, studied it, know many of the situations, I, have, I can conclude this among many things. That one of the reasons this has happened for a long time is there are wolves who are pastors who preyed on people, and there was nobody there to identify them and protect the flock from them. Pastors can be wolves. It's why it's essential that we protect 
the church as pastors from not just the false teachers, but also from themselves. So pastors proclaim and they protect. And so I want to spend our last few minutes giving you three ways that you as a church can respond to these truths. Now, you may be hearing this and thinking, oh good, the applications are going to be for the pastors. I hope what Richard's watching online. Nope. This is actually for you. These three applications I'm going to give you are directly to you as church members. But don't worry, we're going to talk about church members next week in Titus chapter 2. That'll be great. Three things that I want to challenge you with and how you can respond to the word based on what we've seen here in Titus chapter 1. So number one, rejoice that your pastors are God-given gifts to you. So first thing is rejoice. That your pastors are God-given gifts to you. It is no mistake, I am convinced, that Paul begins this letter to Titus establishing God's design for the churches in Crete with defining the role of a pastor and how essential they are to be able to set in order what remains. In other words, to set up the church as it's meant to be so the church can thrive. As I get to work with pastors all over the world, that the faithfulness of pastors in a church can make or break a church. And I want you to know, members of Bloomfield Baptist Church, I, I know your pastor. I've known them a long time. I can remember having lunch with Richard the week he got here to the church. So I've watched it all from the beginning. I know your pastors. And I want you to know, I believe they are faithful gifts to this church. They are not perfect men. Far from it, actually. And I'm surprised I didn't get a bunch of amens when I said that. You already know these guys are not perfect men, are they? Far from it. But I believe they're faithful men. And they've proven that in the labors among you. They are sinners saved by God's grace. They need Jesus just as much as all of you do. So you're all in this together. But I believe they're faithful. And I can testify firsthand of the deep love that they have for each of you. They are a gift to this church. And, and the thing is, is I suspect many of you know this already. So rejoice in that. Rejoice. Thank God that you have them. You don't have perfect pastors. But you have you have faithful pastors, I believe. And I want you to know that I see all over the place there are many churches without pastors. And go years and years without pastors. And you have actually more than one. That's a gift. And I want to encourage you to to rejoice in that. So rejoice that your pastors are God God giving gifts to you. Number 2. Realize you need protection from wolves. You need protection from wolves. I, I meet many Christians who feel they don't need the church, and specifically Christians who would say they don't, they don't need a pastor. But this chapter reminds us that God's design is to have elders in every town. Why? Well, the reason, at least based on this passage, is that every follower of Jesus who's been transformed by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus through faith, needs a pastor, an under-shepherd, to apparently exhort in sound doctrine and rebuke those and protect you from those who would, who would contradict it. And the New Testament, by the way, is full of, of these instructions that pastors are to shepherd the flock of God that is among you. That's 1 Peter 5. Pastors are to take heed to yourself and the flock, that's, that's Acts 20. And these pastors do this particularly to protect the flock from wolves. God's design for you is that you need pastors to care for your own soul. That is God's design. And you need each other to support and encourage one another as you seek to follow Jesus. We're going to talk. More about that next week, Lord willing, as we look at Titus chapter 2. But you are supposed to have pastors. And you do. 
And you have good ones. You have faithful ones. Take advantage of having faithful pastors and commit yourself to them to support them as they seek to care for you and as they seek to, to protect you. So realize you need protection from wolves. Can we agree if you don't think you need protection from wolves, that you can just do this on your own, you won't feel the need for a pastor. But if you realize the danger every Christian is in in this fallen world towards wolves and the enemy who would want to stick those wolves on us and devour us, we have a different appreciation for those who give their lives to protect and care and for your own soul. Last one, number three, ways you can respond to this word. Receive the public and private ministry of the word. Receive the public and private ministry of God's word. If pastors are primarily called to exhort in sound doctrine and rebuke those who contradict it, sound doctrine, in other words, it's referring to God's word. It's referring to the clarity of the gospel of Jesus Christ that, that we hold to and, and believe. Pastors are called to publicly minister the word, which is what happens in this moment when we gather every Sunday morning and hear the word publicly preached. When you go into your classes and you hear the word publicly taught. But there's a private ministry of the word that's just as important. Where we have one-on-one -on -one conversations and they happen in, on your front porch at your house and in hospital rooms and in funeral homes. Where God's word gets ministered to you in conversation. And it's read to you in different ways. That, that's, that's them ministering your, the, God's word privately. My encouragement to you is to receive it. Receive it now in this moment. And then receive it privately when it's done in that way. So if you, if you want to prepare to hear and receive God's word the next two weeks after this. Go home this week and read Titus all the way through. It'd probably take you five to seven minutes, depending on how fast of a reader you are. Sit down and during your devotion time, whenever you read your Bible, and read Titus 1, 2, and 3 in one sitting. If that's too much, read part of it and then come back to it. But if you commit to read the book of Titus every day for the next week, and then you come Sunday, I guarantee you, you will be more apt to receive the word when it's preached from this book. And that can be a wonderful pattern of preparation to receive the public word. Pastors proclaim God's word and pastors protect the flock from those who would seek harm from the church, to the church. It's important that you're aware of the danger and why we need to cling first to Christ under his strong arms of the chief shepherd but then he has provided the protection of pastors also to care for our soul. And that that's the design for you as a Christian, for you as a follower of Jesus in this church to thrive in your life. So you have a pastor who, despite a, a kidney transplant, still plans to come back here. And to continue in the work that God's called him to that he's done here for a long time. Why does he do that? Why is he willing to do that? Probably some people in his life would say, that's a little maybe a much for you to keep doing that. He does it because he feels called by God. He does it because there's deep love for you. You have another pastor here who has carried the load of both pastors. We made a joke earlier. I, I don't even want to know if I walked into your office, would I find a cot there? Why is he do that. Why has he taken on all of this so Richard can recover, so the church can continue to move forward? I can answer the same way. He does it because he feels called by God. But he does it out of his love for you. And when you have two men who serve like that, that is a gift, friend. Regardless on what ways they have failed you and been imperfect in the work that they do, those are faithful men. Anywhere I go in the world, if I see that, I will see and acknowledge faithful men doing the work that God's called them to. I once heard a past, wise pastor say this. He's an old pastor. He'd been in ministry 50 years. And he said, our job as pastors 
is to help as many people as possible get to heaven in the most in the best condition possible. So I want to encourage you to look to your pastors, whatever way they can help you. Help us in this journey to get to heaven in the best condition possible. But I also want to share with you, if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, and you don't know Christ, I want you to know the most faithful pastor, the, the most gifted preacher cannot save you. Jesus is the only one that can save you that can forgive you from your, of your sins, save you from the wrath of God upon sin, and forgive you completely, and give you the hope and the gift and the certainty of eternal life. Only faith in Jesus alone can bring that. And then pastors come along and help you walk with Jesus after you have done that. But it's between you and God alone in regard to your own salvation. So don't let this message confuse you on how you truly become right with God and you're saved from your sins and find eternal life. It is through Christ alone that we find that. And I would encourage you to turn to him today if you don't know him. Let's pray together.